supposed to talk about buying farms and, and agriculture. And I got wind of the uphill battle I'm against, and I was trying to explain this to the guy on the plane on the way here. And he said, buying the farm, isn't that another way of saying somebody's died? <laughs> so bear with me, but I, I do have a positive message, um, and that message is I want us to regrow our agrarian roots. So in the 1940s, the community ranchers where I grew up came together and built themselves a meeting house, a community center for potlucks and barbecues and dances and so forth. But that community is gone, and the meeting house is abandoned. And I want to know why. And if you want to know an interesting fact, there are 758 small family farms and ranches that disappear every single month. That's one an hour. How many farms and ranches will be gone by the time this event is over? We are being sucked into a nameless, faceless system of consolidated food production, which destroys the family farm. So rather than dwelling on doom and gloom, I actually have a positive message, which is to say, let's come back, come back to the land. So if you, if you remember nothing else, remember that, come back to the land. But what it's worth, I did. I gave up a comfortable government job and a guaranteed salary. Came back to ranching, built a business, and struck out on my own. As you can tell, the, the horses thought this was a hilarious concept. But <laughs> that, is, that is probably the first fundamental rule is do not listen to the naysayers. All right? There's a perception out there that what ails us, and it doesn't matter who you are, what ails society is either big business, if you're part of the Occupy Wall Street crowd, or big government, if you sympathize with the Tea Party movement, and so forth. I'm arguing that small agriculture is being squeezed from both ends, and it's a shame. In case we need verification of this, here's some fun facts and figures, right? In 1970, the top five beef companies controlled about one quarter of the overall beef market. Today, there are four main companies, and those four companies control over 80% of the beef business. And some of you will say, well, why do I care? Well, I'll explain it. In 1965, there were 1.1 million dairy operations producing our nation's milk. And today, there are fewer than 63,000. That is a 90% decrease. That means 90% of our dairymen have flat disappeared, gone. 50 years of evaporated milk, right? <laughs> but why should you care? Because it hurts something about our Americanism. And I'll get into that more. Because it's not just in agriculture. In 1997, which wasn't that long ago, the assets of the six largest banks of the United States held about 17% of our GDP. Today, those banks hold well over half of our GDP. So again, who cares? My argument is twofold. First off, when things get big, centralized, and top-heavy, they become unstable. And secondly, and maybe this is more importantly, I think that it has something to do with our psyches, that when we as Americans become comfortable with centralized power and centralized control, we've lost something very, very significant. So this line here represents the fall in the number of people directly engaged in agriculture. And everybody's seen lines like this. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it starts in the 1850s and goes all, all the way to today. But what's amazing about it is that all along this line, there has been a steady progression of government programs designed to save the family farm and help the farmer. But can anyone in this room point out to me on this line where there's been a dramatic success, where they reverse that trend? I'll, show, I'll give you a hint. There isn't one. There's no success. We cannot solve this problem through policy. It resides with us. So a quick history lesson you can tell because it's black and white, right? In 1933, the very first action taken by the Roosevelt administration under what they called the Agricultural Adjustment Administration was to knock on farmers' doors and say, we're going to kill your pigs. 
we're going to butcher, and they did, six million baby pigs. The theory being, by a whiz kid in Washington, that if you kill enough pigs, you'll reduce the supply, and that will increase the price, and all of a sudden the pork farmers will be happy. Well, of course they weren't. I wouldn't have been. And they did this in Alabama, too. They told every Alabama farmer who had spent all summer long growing their cotton crop, oh, by the way, you need to plow under every third row. Unbelievable. The point here is that good intentions coupled with centralized power is not always a benign thing. And it's a shame because Americans like to farm. We want to farm. So enough gloominess. I argue that we can push back. We have the power, all of us in this room have the power to push back and regrow what I call our agrarian roots. And being in Bozeman, I hope that message reverberates somewhere. So I have four ways of doing this. The first one is get some land. It doesn't have to be very much, right? It could be something as simple as a tomato plant in your windowsill. But do that, because that little connection to sunlight Soil and living things will give you the first glimmerings of what it means to be self-sufficient. Secondly, go out and support those of us who've tried to produce food outside of this centralized commodity system. Go to farmer's markets, get to know your producers, understand how it is that food gets into your plate, because it's an amazing process. And effectively vote three times a day with your food dollars. It's amazing that power you have. And number three, if the idea of investing your savings in a nameless, faceless Wall Street investment mechanism bugs you, try something else. There's alternatives out there. Things like slow money and community-supported agriculture and conservation funds and so forth are great ways to put your money where your land ought to be. So you get my drift. You don't have to go buy a ranch to come back to the land. And last, help those of us, small-scale family producers, avoid over-regulation. It sounds political, but I mean it. There There needs to be a space for small producers and individual consumers like you and me to freely transact. I was talking with a guy this morning about raw milk. Apparently in Montana, they're just passing House Bill 1317 or something about raw milk. Those are the kinds of things we need to support. Allow adult decision makers to make their own decisions about what they eat. If we can do this, community and family will come back into its central position. And more importantly, individuals will stop simply accepting misplaced authority. So yes, I'm asking you to come back. Come back to the land. It's vibrant. It's stimulating. It's intellectual. It's exciting. It's good exercise. I was thinking a couple weeks ago we, we had moved this wild steer in, out of the river bottom and he's crashing around through gates and pushing people over fences. fence and I thought, wow, this is great exercise. It was wonderful. <laughs> but do, come back to the land and if we can develop this agrarian root structure, it will prevent the erosion of some of our most cherished American values. So come back. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Good night.